Hi folks, I'm Thomas Henson with ThomasHenson.com and today is another episode of Big Data, Big Questions. In today's episode, we're going to talk about some exciting new changes in Hadoop 3.0 and why Hadoop has decided to go with a major release in Hadoop 3.0 and what all's in it. Find out more right after this. So today I wanted to talk to you about the changes that are coming in Hadoop 3.0. So it's already went through the alpha and now we're actually in the beta phase so you can actually go out there and download it and play with it. But what are these changes that are in Hadoop 3.0 and then why did we go with such a major release for Hadoop 3.0? So what all's in this one? There's two major ones that we're going to talk about but let me talk about some of the other ones that are involved with this change too. So the first one is more support for containerization and so if you go through Hadoop 3.0 and you go to the website you can look you can actually go through some of the documentation and see where they're starting to support some of the docker pieces and so this is just more evidence for the containerization of the world right you know we've seen it with kubernetes there's a lot of different other pieces that are out there with docker and it's just there's there's it's almost like a buzzword to some extent but it's really really been popularized it's really cool changes too when you think about it because if we go back to when we were in hadoop 1.0 and even you know 2.0 it's kind of been a third rail to say, hey, we're going to virtualize Hadoop, and now we're fast forward and switching to uh, some of the containers. And so that's going to be some really cool changes that are coming. Obviously, there's going to be more and more changes that are going to happen to do that, but this is really laying some of the foundation for that support for Docker and some of the other um, containers, major container players out there in the IT industry. Another big change that we're starting to see, once again, this is another, you know, I won't say it's a monumental change, but it's just more evidence for support for the cloud. And so the first one is uh, there's some ex expanded support for Azure's data lake. So think the unstructured data there, uh, maybe our, some of our HDFS components. And then also some big changes in um, Amazon's AWS S3. So S3, they're actually going to let allow for easier management of your metadata with DynamoDB, which is a huge, you know, NoSQL database used in uh, the AWS platform. So those are two, some of, I would say some of the minor changes. Those changes alone probably wouldn't have pushed a pushed it to be a Hadoop 3.0 or a major, you know, a major release. The two major releases, and these are going to deal with the way that we store our data, and it's also going to deal with the way that we protect our data for disaster recovery, and when you start thinking of those enterprise features that you need to have. And so the first one is support for more than two name, name nodes. And so we've had support since Hadoop 2.0 where we were able to set, have a standby, a standby name node. What this gave us in, you know, pre having a standby name node or even, you know, having a secondary name node is, you know, if your Hadoop cluster went down and, or if your name node went down, your Hadoop cluster was all the way down, right? Because that's where, you know, that's where all your data is stored as far as your metadata and it knows, you know, what data is allocated on, the, on each of the data nodes. And so once, once we were able to have that secondary name node and that, you know, that shared journal where, you know, if one name node, one name node went down, you can have another one. But when we start thinking about fault tolerance and disaster recovery for enterprises, we we'll probably want to be able to expand that out. And so this is one of the one of the ways that we're actually going to tackle that in the enterprise is to be able to have those changes. So be able to support more than two name nodes. And so if you think about it with just doing some calculations, um, one of the examples is if you have three name nodes and you have five shared journals, you can actually take two losses of a name node. So you you can have lose two name nodes and your Hadoop cluster still be up and running, still be able to run your you know map reduce jobs, or you know if you're using Spark or something like that, you still have your access to your Hadoop cluster there. And so that's a huge change when we start to think about you know where we're going with the enterprise and you know just the enterprise adoption. So you're seeing a lot of features that are and requests that are coming from the enterprise customer saying, hey, you know, you know, this is this is the way that we do DR. We'd like to have you know more fault tolerance built in, and you're starting to see that. So that was a huge change. Still, you know, one caveat around that, support for those name nodes, but they're still in a standby mode. So don't, they're not what we would talk about when we talk about HDFS federation. So it's not, you know, it's not supporting three or four, you know, different name nodes, you know, in different, different portions of HDFS. And I'm, I've actually got a blog post that you can check out about HDFS federation and kind of where I see that going and, and how that's a little bit different too. So that was a big change. And then the huge change, uh, I've seen some of the results on, on this uh, before it even came out to the alpha. I think they did some testing in uh, Japan Yahoo, but it's about using erasure coding for storing the data. So if you think about how we store data in HDFS, if you remember, 
you know, the default is three, so three times replication. So as data comes in your name node, it's moved to one of your, one of your data nodes, and then two subsequent copies are moved to a different rack um, on two different data nodes. And so that's, you know, that's to give you that fault tolerance there. So if you lose one data node, you're able to, you know, get your data and have your data, you know, in a separate rack that's still be able to run your MapReduce jobs or your Spark jobs or whatever you're trying to do with your data, maybe just trying to pull it back. That's how we traditionally stored it. If you needed more protection, you just bumped it up, but that's really inefficient, right? I mean, you know, sometimes we would talk about that being 200% of your data, but for, for one portion of your data block, but really it's, it's more than that because, you know, most customers they'll have a, you know, DR cluster. And so they have it triple replicated over there. So when you start to think about, okay, you know, in our Hadoop cluster, we have triple replicated in our DR Hadoop cluster, we have triple replicated. Oh, and the data may exist somewhere else you know, as the source data outside of your Hadoop clusters. Um, I mean, that's seven copies of the data. And, you know, how efficient is that for data that's maybe mostly archive or maybe it's a compliance data? You know, you want to keep it in your Hadoop cluster. Maybe you run a batch job over it, you know, once a year. Maybe not. Maybe it's just something you want to hold on to. So if you do want to run a job, you can. So what, what erasure coding is going to do is it's going to give you the ability to store that at a different at a different rate, right? So instead of having a triple replicate it, what erasure coding is basically does is it says, okay, if we have a data block, you know, have data, we're going to break it into six different data blocks, and then we're going to store three parity bits versus when we're doing triple replication, think of having 12, right? And so that the ability to break that data down and be able to pull the data back from the parity bits is going to give you that ability to store, get a better ratio for how you're going to store that data and, you know, what your efficiency rate is too. So instead of 200%, you know, maybe it's going to be closer to 125 or 150. It's just going to depend as you scale. Just something to look forward to, but it's really cool because that gives you the ability to, one, store more data, right? And bring in more data, hold on to it and not think so much about the, okay, you know, this is going to take up, you know, you know, three times the data, you know, just for the, just how big the file is. And so it gives you the ability to hold on to more data and take, you know, take more, you know, somewhat of a risk, right? And be like, hey, you know, I don't know that we need that data right now, but let's hold on to it because we know that we can use erasure coding and we can store it at a different rate. And then, you know, as we start to need it or if it's something that we need later on, we can, you know, bring that back and, you know, take, you know, take that away. So think of erasure coding as more of an archive for your data in HDFS. And so those are the major changes in Hadoop 3.0. I just wanted to talk to you guys about that and just kind of get that out there. Feel free to uh, send me any questions. So if you have any questions for Big Data Big Questions, feel free to go to my website, you know, put it on Twitter, you know, hashtag Big Data Big Questions, uh, put it in the comments section here below. I'll answer those questions here for you. And then always make sure you subscribe so you never miss an episode. Always talking big data, always talking big questions, and maybe some other tidbits in there too. Until next time, see everyone then. Thanks.